Greetings. May your day start with a smile on your face and love in your hearts. Stay home and stay safe. Collective reading will come from the United Methodist Hymnal on page number 531. It's Prayer of Overcoming Adversity. Lord, we pray not for tranquility, nor that our tribulations may cease. We pray for the Spirit and thy love, that thou grant us strength and grace to overcome adversity. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture reading this morning will come from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. On the evening of that day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. 
Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miracles and miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You may remember that last week we read about Mary going to the tomb. And when she found Jesus, she came running back to the place where the disciples were hiding in a locked room. And she was shouting, I have seen the Lord. The, the disciples were surely confused. Some were in disbelief and some just plain thought that Mary had gone over the deep end. That she has become crazy. She was excited. Her attitude was up. And, and she was wanting everybody to hear the good news and to believe. But after Simon Peter and the other disciple came back, their mood was lower. Now I use that word lower because usually the first Sunday after Easter is known as low Sunday. Though many people nowadays don't even know why it's called that. It's just called that. And you know the church, we've always done it that way, so that's how we do it. Maybe it's just because it's a simple thing of feeling like you're coming down from the mountaintop experience on Easter Sunday. We had such a high last week as we, as we thought about Jesus being alive, having walked out of that tomb. And now today, uh, another week has passed and the reality of life has begun to come in and, and, and uh, surround us again. And so now we are in a low frame of mind. I wonder why that is, when we know that Jesus is with us, that we still sometimes get down. I'm, near, I'm not sure what would ever have caused the church to have a low Sunday. After all, Eastertide is a season of joyous celebration. Eastertide is just not Easter Sunday. Eastertide is a period of time, and we should have a, a heart that is light. A heart that is open, a heart that is joyous. So why would we have a low Sunday on the Sunday after Easter? Perhaps the scripture reading this morning is the reason for even considering a low Sunday. The mood was definitely subdued as the, the disciples were behind locked doors. The disciples feared for their lives and uncertainty is a good word to use for them at that point in time. And we heard the scripture reading this morning that on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Overjoyed is a good word. Overjoyed means that our hearts are lifted, that we are overjoyed and in a good mood. And that's where the disciples were when Jesus appeared to them. Okay, things are looking up, right? Well, not exactly. There's always someone in the crowd who has a negative attitude. And if we let that negative attitude influence us, then we will be brought down as well. Maybe we need to consider social distancing ourselves from those people on a regular basis. In the case of the disciples, that one person was who? Thomas. We know that Thomas was not there on that first Sunday evening when Jesus appeared to the disciples. 
We don't know why Thomas wasn't there. Maybe he had some responsibility that he had to go and, and take care of. Maybe he wasn't fearful like the others were of, of somebody coming in, and, and coming in and getting them. Or maybe he was just kind of awestruck because he had witnessed the Lord nailed to that cross. And maybe he just had the thought that all hope had died there on that cross. And so he didn't care whether the Jewish people came and got him or not. But no matter, the scripture says that Thomas wasn't with them when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. But when he finally comes in, immediately the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas' reaction was, yeah, right. And I have a bridge that I want to sell to you guys as well. No, really, they said. But even in all their, their exuberance, Thomas would not believe that they had seen Jesus. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Remember, men, I said last week that uh, Thomas was an example to us. That's why we are stubborn. Well, what I really wanted to say is that we are pig-headed, but I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But stubborn or pig-headed, whatever the word is, that's what Thomas was. He didn't believe. He wasn't going to just follow the crowd because somebody told him something. He questioned it. Now, Thomas has gone down in history to be known as Doubting Thomas. But I'm not sure that that's entirely fair. He simply did what a, a, a number of Christians do. They question. So perhaps he should be known as questioning Thomas instead of doubting Thomas. He didn't believe until he could see for himself. Sometimes I think there's a lesson here that, that we can learn. The fact, is, the fact is, each of us must decide for ourselves when it comes to our faith and our faith walk and what it is that we believe. And that's where the questioning comes in. This is where doubt comes into play. Doubt is necessary to survive. In this world. If we believe everything that we're told, we would soon be in great trouble. So we should always question. And perhaps we should doubt at times. If we never question, if we never have any doubt, chances are we'll never give Christian faith much thought. Doubts, questions, do not have to be the enemy of faith. It is through doubt and through questioning that sends us to the Bible, that takes us to Bible studies where we can dig into that and, and find out for ourselves what it is that we believe. It's kind of like a courtroom. There's one side that presents their case and the other side presents their case and then you are the jury. It's up to you to determine what is right here and what you need to believe. Often we do not really understand what we believe until there is some question, some doubt arises that makes us pray and study and talk and search for the answers. If we want to grow as Christians, it's important to ask questions, to investigate for ourselves. And that's where the Bible study comes in. 
investigation through Bible study is what makes us the Christian that we are because we really get into that if we do it right and we dig to the very depths of the question to find the answer that is right for us. Because there's no lack of information out there if you'll just take the time to go dig for it and to find it. Every time I turn on the television or hear the radio, there's so many opinions out there right now about the coronavirus. And you can listen to one station and they'll tell you one thing and then you turn to another station and they tell you something else and they're conflicting. What do I believe? How do I, how do I determine for myself which one is right? Well, I try to go and find out. I try to go somewhere that I trust that information. And then I weigh what I read and study. And then I make a decision for myself what is right. And that's what we have to do as Christians. We have to study, we have to dig into it, we have to find all the information that we can on both sides of a question and then make up our own mind what we believe. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21, Paul said, to test all things and hold fast to that which is true. Unfortunately, it's my belief that the mainstream media no longer prints or reports the truth. News people used to make sure that they had reliable sources before they put something out. But that's not the case anymore. There's an old joke that goes something like, why did Moses spend 40 years in the wilderness? And the punchline is because men wouldn't stop to ask questions. So they wandered for 40 days. Perhaps one or two days into that trip, if they would just stop and sit down and thought about it and decided, hey, these women are right. We should ask somebody who knows. They wouldn't have wandered for 40 days. I think that's where we are in life sometimes. We just, we wander through life, stumbling over ourselves and listening to one person say something and another person say something else when all we really need to do is research, 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 and then decide for ourselves what is true and what is not. I worked in collections for various financial institutions, banks and savings and loans, and that position tended to harden my outlook on truth. I said one day that I would sit down and write a book about all the excuses that people use about why they can't pay their bills, or when they tell me that they're going to pay it on such and such a day, why they couldn't do that. I got almost to the point that I couldn't believe whatever people told me. They would promise to send a payment or set on such and such a date, and I would just sit there and say, yeah, right. I'll, if I see it, then I'll believe it. I'm thankful that my career path changed because I'd become so skeptical. I didn't want to believe what people told me. I became a doubting Thomas, if you will. We've all been there. Being a doubting Thomas is not all bad. There is value to doubt. There is value to asking questions. Without asking questions, we don't learn. We just go on with the information that somebody else has given us. If we never investigate, if we don't care enough to look into things, we won't grow. 
That statement pertains to our everyday life. That statement pertains to our faith life as we walk that faith journey that we're all on. If we don't care enough to look into it, we won't learn. Thomas had questions. He asked them because he wanted to understand exactly what was happening. Doubt to Thomas was simply faith seeking answers, seeking understanding, seeking knowledge. Doubt is but the growling of the soul for more spiritual food. I, I wish I'd have written down the name of the person that said made that comment, and I, I don't, but I think that's something that we need to listen and hear again. Doubt is but the growling of the soul for more spiritual food. Food nourishes our body. Scriptures, when we understand it, nourishes our soul. Thomas says he will not believe unless he sees Jesus' wounds, unless he sees the scars. He is a doubter, he is a seeker. And then that very next time that the disciples were together, Thomas was there. The scripture we read this morning said they were all together in the same room, in the same place. And again, Jesus appeared and he showed Thomas his wounds. Here he said, touch my hand. Touch my side. And Thomas said, my Lord. And my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Thomas was the disciple from Missouri, the show me state. Thomas said, show me before I believe. For Thomas, seeing was believing. For many people today, seeing is believing. You cannot see the truth, until you have all the facts. We are more like Thomas than we might think. We believe in Jesus not simply because of words that have been said. We believe because of actions of the Christians around us. We believe not only because we've been told about Jesus. We believe because we've seen Christ in others. We carry the name Christian. We claim to be followers of Christ, but do we really reveal something in our spirit, something in our lives, something in our action to show others that we believe? Or do we simply just tell people about Jesus in words? We should show people who Christ is in our lives. Because for a lot of people, seeing is believing. When I was in course of study, we had a textbook that was entitled, They Like Jesus, But Not the Church. The point of that particular book was that the church needs to act like Jesus. The church needs to live like Jesus, not just talk about Jesus and then do something else. We need to act and live the way that we know that Jesus would have us live. For Thomas and really all the disciples, seeing was believing. Jesus said, blessed are those you do not see and yet come to believe. And that's us. We haven't physically seen Jesus Christ, but we see Christ in others. We see how they live, how they, they treat people. And so we've come to believe. We've not seen Jesus, but yet, in a way, we have. 
There are people out there who unless they see something of Jesus and those who are his followers are not very likely to come to believe. So you have a tremendous responsibility. You are responsible for showing Jesus Christ to those who are seeking something We all need some reason to, to believe, like Thomas. We may have doubts and questions. We can question and investigate and find what answers that we can. But there also comes a point where we must step out in faith. And when we do, when we commit ourselves to Christ, when we believe and follow, it becomes easier and easier. As we believe, as we walk with Christ, Christ becomes more and more clear to us. We begin to listen a little closer. We, get, we begin to follow the instructions. Now, man, I know that's hard for us, but we need to learn to follow the instructions. Before he could believe, Thomas needed to see. Jesus held out his hand. He showed Thomas the wounds in his side and Jesus invites us to, to look, to question, to doubt, to investigate, to seek. Jesus holds his hands out to us to show us his scars, the wounds that make us well. And he holds out his hand to welcome us. Amen. I have some joys and concerns that's been passed on to me. We know that if Helen was sitting here in this pew that she would have us pray for Larry. So I lift Larry up for prayer as well as Helen. I lift up Maurice Wright. Uh, he needs prayer. I lift up Hazel Croth. She needs prayer. Both of them are, 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 are on our midweek uh, minute that I send out with the reasons. And, and I'll just let you go to that to, to remember both of those. I know each and every one of those would like to have uh, cards and letters and texts and emails. I had a joy last Sunday. As I came to the church to pre-record last Sunday's message, Shannon was sitting at the, at the uh, piano. It was unexpected because I hadn't told her what time we were going to be here. She hadn't played before. I'd been using uh, uh, CDs for the music. And that service was so uplifting to me, Shannon, and Shannon that I went home and, and it just felt like it was really Sunday morning to have you play for us. And going forward, Shannon has agreed to continue to play when we pre-record. If you're unable to get out a message that is to those that may be shut in with nobody to help, if you're unable to get out to get groceries or medications or some necessities and don't have anyone to, to do that, there is a list of church members that I have that is willing to go and do that for you. Just contact me and I will get you in touch with somebody on that list. Also, uh, uh, some more information. Judy Clutchy has been sewing face masks for Aldersgate and uh, the rescue mission. And uh, she sent me a, a text the other day, or an email the other day, that advised that uh, they don't need any more at this time. So if you're in need of a face mask, you might contact Judy Clutchy and see if she has some that... Uh, she would be willing to get to you. And finally, uh, remember to tithe to the church. If you are able, send your check to the um, church address or to the treasury secretary's uh, uh, address. And let's keep the tithes coming so that we can still pay the bills that, uh, that accrue, even though we're not here physically. If you have joys or concerns that you would like to have me include in our midweek moment, please text me or email me so that I can include those.
Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, there are people in this congregation experiencing loneliness, isolation, and depression. Give them the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of, getting their, of, of gritting their teeth, but the glory strength that only you can give. Give them the strength and, and, uh, and endurance that it takes that spills over into joy knowing that they can get through anything because you are there with them. Open our eyes to the brightness and the beauty that is in the world and give us all strength in our times of weakness. Father God, there are people in this congregation who need encouragement to continue the good that they're doing every day. Do not let them get discouraged. Uplift them and strengthen them as you bless them in whatever attempt that they do. You have blessed us with the opportunity to know these people and many times they have without fanfare or need of recognition stepped up when someone needed something and did what was needed to help. There are people in this congregation who are going through sickness, injury, and bouts with cancer. Heal them in whatever way that you see fit. Ease their pain, ease their frustration, and ease their doubt that they will not get well. Father God, there are people in this congregation who work in the healthcare fields, nurses, pharmacy assistants, hospital workers, and other positions who are on the front lines of the fight against this coronavirus. Please keep them safe and healthy so that they can do their jobs without worry or concern. And keep us together as people of the church, even though we physically are separated from one another. Help us to reach out in whatever way we can to help those in need, comfort those who are sick, and serve you through that outreach. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. here physically they are here in my heart and so today to each of you I say God bless you stay home and stay safe and we'll see you next week